we have with us today Ravi Kumar Ramanan to present us on the uh, various insights from his book, The CFO Lens. Uh, he is basically a chartered accountant with about 30 years experience. He was the CFO and board member of IBM and has global experience having worked in four countries. He started his career in management consulting. The job carried responsibility for both delivery and sales. He then worked with two iconic technology companies, Digital Equipment and IBM. He gained varied experience in strategy, business value creation, business recovery, international taxation, and M&A. He was CFO of IBM's $4 billion systems and technology division of APAC. Ravi Kumar has also performed non-finance roles too. In addition to being con in consulting, he spent significant time in sales activities of business development and deal making. In that process, he engaged himself very extensively with the customers. In fact, uh, as IBM finance controller, over half a dozen on over a half a dozen occasions, he received special sales commission and recognition for working with customers, helping sales teams close deals. He led the enterprise risk management and managed a large $400 million APAC cost center. He's a member of the industry and policy bodies such as the CIA CFO Forum. He, uh, he has authored two books. Uh, the first one, Oriental Tunes, is about the culture and customs in Japan and China, where he and his family had lived. This book was privately distributed. In April this year, he published a book, The CFO Lens, How to Thrive in the Fast-Changing World of Finance, and he will briefly talk about it today. Over to you, Ravi Kumar. Thanks for accepting to address our members. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to uh, FENG, uh, Charlotte, Arun, yeah. uh, Vineet, and uh, the team, um, uh, and FENG for providing me this opportunity. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people here on the call, different time zones, uh, early morning to Friday evening in 7.30 p.m. in India. Never a pleasant time to listen to somebody else. Uh, but uh, let me, uh, um, you know, I uh, what I will do today is uh, I will talk about two things. One is uh, generally on the subject of uh, the secret of high-performing CFOs. And I'll give you some background to it before we get there. And uh, later on, towards the end of my uh, presentation, I'll talk very briefly about my book. Um, uh, um, Arun, thanks for the introduction. There, let me make a very small but important correction to the introduction. You said I was CFO of IBM. I was CFO of IBM India, not of CFO of IBM. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, and um, uh, uh, you know, I uh, let me uh, uh, let me start with um, uh, with an introduction um, about what we will speak today. I mean, the people on this call are all very senior people, very, very experienced, global experience, people living in different countries. I don't need to tell them about how much the role of finance has transformed. Everybody knows it in their sleep. Uh, but just to do a very quick two-minute recap to set the background of uh, the transformation in finance, uh, if you look at the business uh, environment uh, that has um, uh, that has uh, that prevailed that has prevailed in the last 10 20 years uh, uh, increasingly uh, the aspect of returning value or creating value and returning uh, may, having a good return on investment to stakeholders is becoming important and gaining more and more weightage in as a business objective it has always been a business objective obviously but in recent times, in recent years, recent decades and recent years, as risk uh, grows uh, in a very, very competitive world, uh, shareholder value creation and return on investment is gaining extremely high weightage in the purpose and objective of any business undertaking. And uh, to match that uh, is the intense competition in the world. Uh, extraordinary competition coming can come from any part, from any size of organization, 
um, and we've heard the word, we hear the word disruption n times a day. What this has done to organizations is it has made growth. If you want to create shareholder value, the only way you create shareholder value is through growth. And um, growth in revenue, growth in profit, uh, you know, those kinds of objectives. And so what happened over a period of time as um, uh, what happened over a period of time as this as this became the norm in the in the business environment uh, and business objective is with so much expectation from stakeholders, from shareholders, from uh, investors and private equity and so many people from the board, from the CEO. It has no longer become possible for sales to be the only engine, the sales organization to be the only engine that drives growth. Um, uh, it's not possible in, in this kind of an environment. It, over time, what happened was everybody had to contribute to sales, to growth, to those critical, to that one or two critical objectives of the organization. Uh, and uh, therefore, Finance, you know, came into play, and and that's where the transformation of finance began. The transformation of finance began. Uh, to put it in a nutshell, we went from reporting. Um, uh, I mean, well, what we used to do was we used to uh, report, then it transformed to support, then it transformed to enable, uh, enabling the business, and today it is acceleration of the business. So we're probably in uh, another stage of transformation that we were expected to be enablers of growth, but that is no longer sufficient for organizations for us to be enablers of growth. They want finance to be accelerators of growth, uh, to play an even more uh, critical part, even more front end uh, part. We often use the word partnership. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, you know, people often use the word uh, and to, de to define the role of finance as, finance as the co-pilot, finance as the co-strategist, uh, and so many so much of this jargon has been going around for quite a long time. And that those they are all true. That's what is expected of us. The only objection I have to, uh, on, on a lighter note, the only objection I have to uh, using the word finance as a co-pilot is that I often tell, I used to tell my CEO, you want me to co be a co-pilot, please pay me as a co-pilot. Don't play me as a steward. <laughs> so, and that's that's finance has kind of suffered somewhere in that we never get paid, or uh, not always do finance will get paid as co-pilots. Uh, but anyway, that's that's a completely different subject. Um. um so, uh, uh, what I want to talk to about today is this role of finance as an accelerator of growth. This transformation of how does finance transform itself from being an enabler of growth to an accelerator of growth, uh, take finance to the next level. Um, and um, so that's, that's what I will talk about today. And uh, I, have put, I have put up a slide deck. It's a, it's a fairly short one. Um, if, you, uh, if you're able to see it, I hope uh, uh, people are able to see that. And I will now start using that. And if you go um, <clears throat> on the first page, our objective now is to make business successful and in that process, make finance successful. Um, and uh, uh, there are four things that finance can do. And uh, of the many things that finance can do, this is not a comprehensive list. There are so many different things that finance is, is, uh, is expected to do. For example, investor relations that I will not be talking about today. So I just picked four areas where I think finance can do more than what we have done in the past. Maybe some of us are already doing it. Maybe some of us need to do more of it. But I thought I'll uh, talk about if we want to make business successful and if we, if we want to take finance to the next level, I think we need to do four things. One is build a deeper understanding of the business, focus on execution, uh, enable sales, and sellers and build soft skills in the entire finance team. And um, let me uh, now elaborate on each of these. Uh, mm -hmm. If I uh, if I go to the if I go to the next page, um, you know, build a deeper understanding of the business. I'm now on uh, page three of the slide deck. And um, you know, I was um, 
I was mentoring, um, we all mentor younger professionals. And I was recently having a, I was having a recent conversation with one, one of the younger professionals, very bright IAM uh, management graduate. Uh, and he was asking me about six, seven years experience, about I think 30 or 31. Uh, and he was asking me why, uh, despite all that finance does, why does a sales, why does sales still not respect finance as much as we think they should, or as much as somebody else should, I think, or we we think, or or we deserve. And one of the grouses of that uh, is one of the reasons for that is there is this grouse against finance professionals that finance does not understand the business deeply. And to some extent, there is truth in that. Our understanding of the business is with reference to numbers. Our understanding of the business is somewhat at surface level. Um, we don't understand the market. We don't understand customers. And I'm, I'm, I may be using, I may not be using the most appropriate words when I say we don't understand, we don't, you know, we, we do, but not enough. And um, how, how deeply um, we are now in a world where Finance is expected to provide business solutions. Earlier, we were expected to provide financial solutions. We were expected to you know, do profit analysis. We were expected to do revenue analysis. We were expected to do terms and conditions of contracts. Those were financial solutions. And then whenever the finance sales teams were in trouble, we had to go provide solutions. Now that's no longer the case. Uh, what we are expected to do is provide a solution to every business problem. And you will not be able to provide and in order to provide solution to business problems, we need to understand the business much more deeply. And here is an anecdote from, uh, from one of my colleagues. And uh, some of these anecdotes I, I will use today. In fact, all of them that I will use today, I have used in my book also. And uh, here's, here's, an, here's an interesting that a CFO of a company uh, did, of a food delivery company, you know, how important food delivery has become. Um, uh, to um, uh, in 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 today's world, and uh, 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 he uh, in the first month, this was about six seven years back when food delivery industry itself had just started picking up, and um, uh, as a CFO when he joined the company, uh, and that company is now worth several billion dollars, um, uh, not yet done an IPO, but has become one of the most successful food delivery companies. He joined the company about six, seven years back when the company was still small. And within the first month of joining the company, he told the CEO that I need 10 days off. Uh, and if you're the boss, then you just join. Why do you need 10 days off? And he said, I want 10 days off from the finance role. I want to go out into the market and I want to understand every aspect of the business. And... Um, he then went out into the market and actually started literally, as they say, rolling his sleeves up. He started going and meeting restaurant owners. Uh, he went to restaurant owners uh, to find out uh, what is it about doing business with the food delivery company. Uh, he then went to cloud kitchens and spent half a day in, in, in a cloud kitchen trying to find out how do cloud kitchens perform? What are the problems they have? Then, since they were in a high growth phase, he went to a recruitment center, uh, which was doing, a, I know, these companies, start, overnight they recruit in hundreds, right? And he then went to a recruitment center and uh, spent a day in a recruitment center, going through the various processes that the recruitment center does. What is the experience of the candidate? What is the experience of the recruitment center? What are the issues they face? What are the process problems involved? And then, at the end of it, he actually uh, uh, went pillion on a bike with a delivery boy. And he went delivering for about a few hours, he went delivering food to customers. And he actually experienced the life of a food delivery boy, getting the order on the mobile. How easy to, is it to understand uh, the orders that come in? How easy to, are the maps uh, to reach customers? What is their experience in dealing with restaurants? What is their experience in dealing with cloud kitchens? absolute on-ground experience. And he, uh, one of the most successful CFOs today, uh, I have quoted him multiple times in the book. Uh, he says, how are you going to, ev every decision that a finance, finance person makes, a CFO makes, 
is about these actions, about recruitment, about restaurant restaurant contracts, about dealing with cloud kitchen. And how are you ever going to make a good decision if you don't understand what's going on on the ground? And that's that's brilliant, uh, you know. And that's just one example. I'm sure there are hundreds of such examples. I know the uh, the uh, founders of uh, one of the most successful e-commerce companies um, in India called Flipkart, which Walmart bought uh, four years back at I think twenty or twenty one billion. Um, they did the same thing. Uh, they acted as delivery boys for a few days. So you know, fine. That's what finance needs to do. We need to get out of our offices. We need to go meet and this is you meet every single stakeholder. If you okay, so you're not in the restaurant or the B2C business, you're not in the commerce in the retail business, you're in let's say automobile manufacturing, then you will have dealers, you'll have distributors. If you're in a consumer good company, you will have retail outlets. Actually, go out there and experience the market. Unless finance people experience the market, they're not going to be able to make quick, good decisions that are required in today's world. And that is the first point. Spend time in the market, visit the field, meet different stakeholders. And <clears throat> another CFO gave me, in the course of my writing a book, gave me, shared a very interesting experience. He said, uh, I was preparing the delegation metric. He was in a hotel business, which ran a chain of hotels that owned hotels between 200 and 400 rooms. And one day he decided they were updating the delegation metric. And he said, what am I sitting in the office and doing the delegation metric? Let me go and see how the delegation works in the ground. And he actually went to a hotel, one of their hotels, and spent time there and you know, met customers, met um, uh, the staff, met the hotel manager. And he found the gap between what we set as policy and procedure sitting in the office to what is actually phased by people by the company's own staff. Uh, there were some things that were very good about the delegation, but there was something very, very, when customers wanted very, very small things, the hotel manager had no authority to say yes on the go. They had to wait a few hours. And by that time, the customer experience is already bad. So, you know, it's, uh, it's about envisioning how your delegation plays out in the market, how your pricing plays out in the market, how the cost decisions you place out in the market. And my, I leave this uh, chart with, uh, I leave this slide with one recommendation to all CFOs on this, uh, on this call, all leaders on this call, is to make interaction with the field mandatory for finance people. In some form, if you're very junior, I understand you cannot go out to the market. No salesperson is going to take you out to the market. Uh, you will face resistance, even if you're a mid-level person. The sales team is going to resist your interacting with customers. But there are many ways of resisting with customers. You know, somebody else told me that they went with the procurement function and sat down in a commod. They were in the, the, the person was a controller at a, in a uh, or the business unit controller in a commodities company. And he went out and sat in an auction uh, and experienced that. So there are many ways of interacting with the stakeholders in the market. Today, fortunately, in the world of, uh, in the post corona COVID world, there are lots of Zoom calls. There are a lot of interaction with customers that take place over Zoom calls or video calls. If you're a finance person, go sit on one of those video calls and experience what interaction takes place between salespeople and, and the customer. Get a first hand feel for yourself. That is enough. You don't have to step out of the office. You still get a field experience by, um, uh, you know, as one CFO remarked to me, saying you need to meet customers just to experience the unreasonableness of their demands. You know, it's a very funny statement. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, so you can do those kinds of things. So, you know, that there are many things you can do to build a deeper understanding of the business. I just laid out a few of them. Um, uh, let me now go on uh, to the next uh, uh, suggestion. Uh, the other thing that finance needs to do, to do differently from what we are doing today uh, is execution. You know, if you, um, uh, uh, they say um, on execution, uh, they say uh, execution, good execution is the best strategy. And we've all heard this uh, terminology, execution will have strategy for breakfast, right? 
So, uh, and there's this very, very good book by the name Execution written by uh, Larry Bossidy, uh, um, uh, co-authored by Larry Bossidy, who, is, um, uh, who was the CEO of, global CEO of Honeywell, uh, which talks about that organizations, most organizations fail because of bad execution, not because of bad strategy. And we all know that. But the point is that uh, finance people now want to increasingly engage in strategy. At the end of the day, there'll be a very small, the people who engage in strategy are very few at the time of the strategy formulation. It is the senior people. Um, what finance need to, uh, and so everybody doesn't engage the entire finance organization, the CFO, the control of the business unit. Everybody doesn't engage in strategy all the time, but everybody is engaged in strategy execution 365 days of the year. And that's the opportunity to finance, for finance to elevate themselves to the next level and um, you know, make those decisions successful. So um, you know, I've, I've used the second uh, statement I've used in this, this slide is to say, go beyond providing financial approvals. So let's say somebody comes and says, I need to spend um, uh, you know, uh, 10 crore rupees or you know, one and a half million dollars on this particular initiative. I need a capex. I need finance approval for it. And then we do all the financial evaluations, the IRRs, the NPVs, and we ask all the questions. And then we approve it. Or we approve, we don't approve, we approve it. Let's say we approve it. If we have approved an initiative, a capital investment, a decision that is related to growth, and somebody tells you that if you give, this, give me this money, I can grow the revenue, which is the ultimate objective, going back to the ultimate objective. If we, today, most finance professionals stop at providing the approval. If I'm a business unit controller, I'm the controller of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, one of the business, one of the five business units in my company. I stop at giving approval. I'm urging finance professionals across the board to take the next step and make that decision, that capital expenditure decision successful by engaging by participating in the execution process, right? Go participate in the execution process and uh, make, so if you, uh, I, I'll give you an example in the next slide of, of my own experience in that, what I mean by, um, uh, by go participating in the execution process. And in, in that process, um, uh, you can do, you know, the organization has, at the, at the beginning of the year or through the year, makes many strategic decisions. Uh, let's say, for example, let's as an example, let's say at the beginning of the year, the company has four key strategic initiatives. We have ten major, ten strategic, out of which four are in, four are critical to the business unit or the organization. Why don't I say, as a business unit controller or as a CFO of the company, saying, "Let me own one of them," right? And when I say, let me own one of them, uh, my, entire, my entire focus and approach um, uh, of changes from just the strategy itself to the execution of the strategy. I am now in much more engaged and involved in making that strategy successful. We all do it. The moment we all say, hey, I own this. Let me own it. Our engagement automatically increases. Our mindset changes towards that particular objective. So that's what I mean by own a strategy. And I'll give you an example. It's the same one that I will use uh, in the next uh, in the next slide deck. Uh, so uh, you know, coming back to the topic of uh, execution, uh, uh, you know, if we're, so, you know, at the time of making any strategic decision, at the time of approving any expenditure for us. In the implementation of a strategy, I gave you the example of somebody coming and says, "Allow, allow me to open this, uh, do this, uh, to to maybe open a little factory or a branch, and let me spend two million dollars on it." Uh, uh, we make many assumptions in that process. The the whole business case of that investment for growth uh, has several assumptions: assumptions of revenue, assumptions of cost, assumptions of Hiring people, assumptions relating to how uh, com how we will uh, tackle competition, right? Beat competition um, or stay ahead of competition. 
we make many assumptions and the moment you execution is really about making those assumptions come true and by participating in the assumptions in in in, in closer in execution you are actually making the uh, making the decision successful you are giving yourself and the organization and the business unit and the company that you support a greater opportunity to succeed because what we do when we make when we do a business case we make these assumptions this is the cause this is the revenue we will grow by so much you know blah 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 we put it aside and then we are totally glued to what's going on day to day we don't link it back to the assumptions all the time that's critical we look at the assumptions it's not that we you know throw the assumptions into a bin but this the moment you focus more on execution it also provides you the opportunity to to make sure that those assumptions come true you're much more glued on to the process of realizing the assumption and that's what makes everything successful realizing uh, your goals realizing is what makes whether it's a career or whether it's an organization or it's an investment that's what makes it successful um let me go to the next slide um uh you know enabling uh uh i i i i'm i'm i my apologies i i need i need to go back to the last slide i to the previous slide i was to uh you know share with you uh an example of owning a strategy and uh here's what i did uh, is my own experience and uh uh, you know, I was with IBM India, and I was a CFO of the company. And the company, um, uh, this this head of sales, uh, wanted uh, had uh, in the middle of the year came up with a strategy initiative, saying we are not focusing enough on tier two, three cities in India and South Asia, and we are only focusing on the top six, seven cities. You know, the three cities that. In India and outside India, everybody is uh, the names that people are well aware of. You know, Mumbai, Delhi, Calcutta, Chennai, Bangalore. Is just, we are too focused on that. There's a huge market outside that. We are there, we are present, but we are not spending enough money. We are not spending enough time and attention. Uh, and we need to do much more. Of we need to spend far more money and invest far more money in those markets. And I need a pretty fat amount of money as capex investment. And when the CEO and I, and then it is, you know, above beyond a certain amount, the leadership, entire leadership team gets involved. And when we sat down to discuss that, I was not in favor of that decision, in favor of that strategy. I thought we need not make that much investments. We can do, yes, we the, the objective is right, but not the way we want to do it, not the amount of money we want to put into it. Uh, and uh, I was kind of a naysayer. Uh, and um, at, to cut a long story short, the investment, as was nearly originally proposed, they asked for, I think, I, I don't remember, I think some, something like uh, seven or eight million dollars um, uh, in Indian rupees. That's about 50 ish crores and rough amount. This has come some time back. I am just taking numbers for reference uh, in, 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 you know, in the exact amounts. That we, we did prune it down to something, but largely the original strategy went through. And uh, <clears throat> in, in a sense, <clears throat> you know, I um, uh, something that I didn't support went through because the CEO then put a stamp saying, no, no, we got to find the money and we got to do this. And when the execution actually began uh, and actual capital expenditure requests started coming to me, and this happens to everybody, uh, all, all CFOs, leaders, finance professionals, because I, I did not support the strategy at the beginning, I was grumbling. I was making noise. Uh, why are you doing this? I was asking too many questions. And somebody one day came and pointed out to me saying, don't you think you're asking too many questions? And, you know, the calm, calm moments in life are few these days. But when I was driving back home, uh, I really asked myself such a question saying, was he right? Uh, once the company had decided on the strategy, whether I supported it or did not, did not support it at, before the decision was made, I had, and we all say that to ourselves and we all do it many times. We all do it always. But in some sense, I was not, you know, fully on board. And that's when I decided saying, this is bad behavior on my part. I need, I must 
you know, make this strategy successful. And I took a different approach. Instead of just <clears throat> mentally telling myself, okay, let me not make all this noise. I went to the CEO after a few days and said, you know what, I want to become the owner of this strategy. He said, what do you mean by owner of this strategy? I said, I know we are mid-year or not at the beginning of the year, but you can add it to my goals. Add it to my goal sheet, make success of this initiative one of my goals for the year. <clears throat> now, finance people are never paid on goals and initiatives, and they should not be paid. But, and I knew that. I said, Ob obviously, there's no money associated with this, but I still want to, I want to be measured by this, by the success of this. And guess what? My entire attitude changed. I now was very keen on making that, the decision was anyway taken, the company was anyway spending money. I was anyway having to sign off. Yeah, maybe I, mm, you know, cut the original 8 million to 6 million. And now while, um, you know, approving, I was bringing it down to five and a half, but the company was spending that money. And my entire attitude changed. And um, the moment I said, I'm going to own it, now I had to be careful. I still had to play the controller's function, right? I still had the conflicting role. It's not that I had to go, I could go and, you know, freak out in the marketplace. But what I decided to do was to actually ship myself out into the market. I called, called the sales leader and said, look, this, this is what the CEO and I have decided. I want to now travel to those cities in which you're investing the money. I want to go there. I want to meet our salespeople. I want to meet customers. I want to understand how business gets done, how you're actually going to execute on this strategy. And then I started traveling and the sales teams were delighted because how often do you have, if you're going into a smaller city, a tier two city or a tier three city, the customers are going to be smaller and they are not going to provide, just because IBM has decided to you know, focus more on that market, the customers are not going to be excited about it. They say, why the hell do you want to come and see me? Right? Um, all of a sudden, you're showing too much interest in me. And they, they said, no, no, our CFO wants to meet you. Uh, and so I could be, it acted as a door opener. I went to the CEO. I mean, they could get appointments with the CEO to say, you know what, the IBM CFO wants to, uh, wants to come and meet you. And uh, I went to these cities, I sat down and it gave me tremendous, first of all, back going back to the chart, uh, the previous uh, discussion, you know, understanding the business more deeply. It gave me a tremendous understanding of the market. Uh, it gave the sales teams a feeling that I was part of them and not the other guys just asking questions. And I had to be very careful. I still had to ask the same kind of questions. I still had to be frugal when we spend the money. But, you know, out of experience, you learn to balance that. And that, you know, my own experience this time, I, I already had like more than 20 years of experience by then. But this thing of saying own a strategy completely changed my mindset. And, uh, you know, that others perceive you now, the organization now perceives you as a leader versus just the finance team perceiving you as a leader. Uh, and that's a change that organizations want of you as a finance person. So um, uh, this, I mean, these are all interlinked. If you go back to the, if you go to the next chart now, it says enable sales and sellers. This was one action to enable sales and sellers. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I will share from my own personal experience, and this happened by chance, was, um, you know, Arun in his introduction told me that I met extensively with customers. I, and IBM did, um, uh, you know, uh, this was IBM's heydays. IBM no longer does that because the market has changed or does very little, less of that in a different way today. But uh, IBM was the king of outsourcing, IT outsourcing. And we used to sign large, huge contracts. Globally, we used to sign $1 billion, $5 billion, in India, we used to sell, sign $300 million, $400 million contract. After some time, we started signing a billion, $2 billion contracts. And instead of just being the finance guy and the pricing guy and the commercial guy, the finance team used to go sit down with the sales team. Outsourcing contracts take six to eight months to sign. They don't get done in two to three months. They require tremendous, they are tenure contracts and require tenure pricing. They're very complex. How do you price for 10 years in a technology industry where everything is changing overnight. So what we decided in IBM India was to say that, why are we doing this so much from the office? Let's go sit in the customer location along with the sales guys and do it. And then I started doing that. At that time, I was not the CFO. I was the financial controller, so I could afford to take some time off. And believe me, I, I have to confess that uh, it was not that I raised my hand. I got thrown in. Somebody pulled me and said, you better get out of your chair and go sit 
in the customer location. What the hell are you doing sitting in the office? And I was very reluctant. I was hesitant. I had never done a sales, met customer, too many customers in closed deals. And I goofed up. The first one, I made many mistakes. I opened my mouth when I should not have. I did not open my mouth when I should have. And the sales team was quite upset. So when, but finally, we succeeded. We got the contract. But it taught me a lot. And then IBM, the success of the contract meant IBM um, signed many, IBM India signed many more outsourcing deals after that. That's what we wanted to do as a strategy after the first one. And then I started going out now regularly into the market. So first, to, be, to put it very candidly, I, it's not that I was this genius who said, I'm going to you know, mantle a sales role along with a finance role. But I had consulting experience. I, was, I had done sales at the beginning of my career. And that then made me then go do other non-outsourcing deals. I've spoken about you know, a couple of that to them in the, in the book. Um, but that, again, working directly with customers is the next thing that finance should do. CFO should do, finance, mid-level finance professionals, business unit controllers should do, start engaging directly with customers. You have to start it slowly. You have to start it gradually. Our own, your own sales teams, our own sales teams will not accept us initially. There will be tremendous resistance. They will not like the idea of, uh, of uh, you know, finance uh, wanting to uh, engage uh, with people in sales. But once you start doing this and once you start helping, and you learn to help them over time, once you start doing that, they will pull you into the market. Believe me, you will be in demand. They will want you because now the customer, when they, whenever there are difficult terms and conditions, whenever there are difficult discussions, commercial discussions, finance is in a much better position to answer those questions and, and solve the problem. What the other thing that we can do in the marketplace is many large companies have silos. And when they approach the, the customer, they don't want to listen to the customer. It is a silo. The siloed behavior, we all know it. I'm not telling this, uh, the 60 participants on the, uh, 50 participants on this call, anything new. We frustrate customers with our siloed behavior when we approach, when the company approaches customers. And when a finance guy is there in that decision, either sitting in the finance, in the client's office or sitting in, the, in your own company's office, when we actually participate much more closely in the deal, by engaging with our own sales teams much more closely, you don't have to go to the customer location. You don't have to interact with the customer. But if you sit down with your own sales teams and say, hey, tell me the problems that you're facing. I don't want to hear just the finance problems. Tell me all the business problems that you're facing in closing this deal. And again, you will do it only for large deals. You're not going to do it for you know, every small deal and spend your time or their time. Then your ability to find business solutions, help them break those silos is much better. Because as a finance person, you're not a silo anymore. You're not the silo. You want the entire organization to succeed. If you're a CFO, you want the entire organization to succeed. And you're able to break those silos. And that's what, uh, you know, you're seen as a collaborator now. You're seen as a person who works cross-functionally. Um, so, you know, working directly with customers, working with these ecosystems, go meet dealers and dealers if you're not, if you're in an automobile company. You, um, <clears throat> or in, in, a, in a warehousing company. Go meet the dealers who, uh, you know, uh, stock your products. Find out what their issues are. Solve their problems. And believe me, they will, you will find many issues that you can actually help out. They may be very small issues. They may be very small solutions, but that's fine. It's better than being in the office and, you know, and this is what I meant by, at the beginning of the first slide, when I said by, even if you don't want to go sit down in front of a customer, even if you don't want to do a lot, when you say, when I say spend a mandatory number of hours on the field, a finance person, this is what I meant by that. Go do any number of things that can solve companies' problems. And that's what organizations want finance to do today. Uh, you know, solve problems that are not just finance in nature. Um, and the last bullet on this one, enabling, so when, when I said enable sales and sellers, uh, one of the things that I want to talk about is today's world is about customer experience. And customer experience is everything to companies today. Uh, and we all know how important this has become. We all know how important 
a customer experience has become the organization's success. Whether you're a startup or whether you're an entrenched 50-year-old company, a 25-year-old company, global company, whatever you are. And uh, today, fortunately, with the development of so, with so much technology, there are various, uh, the term, we are familiar with the term, the customer journey. The customer journey is the various steps that the customer is involved in, you know, product development, awareness, uh, getting the customer to your website, making the customer consider your product, the customer's actual experience when they come to your website and try to buy something, and the actual act of loading a cart and buying something. These are the various touch points of customer experience. I'm just giving you some as an example. And today there are metrics available in an organization about everything. There are uh, data, there is data available about how long it took to answer for a call center person to answer a call. How long did the call last? What is the nature of complaints coming in? Finance should now engage with marketing and with the business teams and understand that data. Understand the actual experience of a customer because we need to direct money and investments, whether they are in the budget or whether they are not in the budget, into those areas where customer experience is either poor or need to be enhanced. Because we can, there's no point putting money where the budget is. No point putting in money where uh, only on growth initiatives if the current, current customer experience is not so good. And one of the things that we get, one of our own areas which we, which touches customer experience, which we've been engaged in forever, is in invoicing, in uh, collection. And collection, whenever we engage in collection, I, I, I used to keep telling this to my team, uh, that it is time now for, finable, for finances, accelerators of growth to stop reviewing accounts receivable data just as accounts receivable. Accounts receivable information that you get, whenever you get on a call and hear all the problems of why customers are not paying you or what they want done before they, before they pay you, is tremendous information about customer experience. If customers are not paying you, if they're, in, they're unhappy, accounts receivable is your greatest tool of, of experiencing what customers go through, what, what, how customers perceive your company, your product, your invoicing process, your salesperson, the commitments that they made. So stop viewing AR data just as the receivables or cash management. AR receivables and cash management process for finance is a tremendous tool to, uh, to experience, uh, to, uh, to participate in customer experience. And I say, along with to tracking touch points, which I mentioned earlier, along with using accounts receivable data, engage in customer experience. Take finance to the next level. Start tracking that point, those point, data points of them and link them to the investment and the expenditure decisions that you're making. Uh, let me go on to my last slide. Um, on on this particular topic, uh, I'll, I'll I have I will leave time for Q and A. I will rush through this chart. I don't have too much time. Uh, building soft skills in finance teams, you know, storytelling. Uh, I have one question, and we you know we've been talking about storytelling for quite some time now. We get expert storytellers to come and talk to us, and we know the importance of storytelling. Um, but we are still very data focused as finance person when we speak. We don't speak enough business language. You know, there is a Harvard, I think a Stanford professor did a, did a survey uh, to say that at the end of any presentation, the audience, which in our case is the sales team or the, the manufacturing team or the delivery team, they remember 63% of the stories told on only 5% of the data. Whereas we like to fill our presentations with data. If they can't remember it, why are we focusing so much on data? Why are we not focusing enough on storytelling? We do, by the way, we have, our finance as, a, as, a, as an organization from the CFO downwards are far more focused in storytelling. But to be honest, in my opinion, we have not made enough progress. We have not becoming, I want to ask a question to people on this call saying, do you really believe finance has made significant progress as storytellers today than they were five years back, one year back, two years back? Measure yourself, not just by saying, yeah, you know, I, I heard a YouTube chat, I heard, heard about storytelling, the art of storytelling on YouTube. I heard the speaker, that's not enough. Are you actually doing storytelling when you're making a presentation? I, I've spoken about that. That's my first chapter in my book, actually. My book starts with saying, uh, the world is, the universe is made of stories, not atoms. Um, and I explained that. 
as to why the universe is made of stories, not atoms. Um, that's in fact the first line of my book. Um, uh, so we we don't uh, you know um, communicate enough in business language. We talk data. We uh, you know, and the other expectation from and this is the last one that point that I will make is we the the changed expectation on for finance as an accelerator of growth is to solve cross functional problems. Again, I was back to the siloed behavior that we do. The CEO many times is not does not have the time or the energy to the, the different functions, the sales, manufacturing, the five business unit, they're always, at, or with logistics or finance or HR, there's always friction and the CEO doesn't have enough time to solve cross-functional problems. Finance has an end-to-end -end view of the business and is in a very good position to solve cross-functional problems. We don't have to solve every problem. We don't have to own every problem. We need to bring people together. And that's what CEOs expect of us to do. Be the anchor. Be the leader who brings people together. I'm not expecting you to solve the problem. That's what one of my CEOs used to tell me. Ravi, I don't want, I'm not, a, but be me. Go out there. Here is this problem that these two divisions are warring. They're, they're not talking to each other. The customer is suffering. Go solve this problem for me. And that's when I learned that finance can add a lot of value in those situations. Many things you, you fail. You know, the, the business units will be so headstrong that they will not give in. It will go back to the CEO. But at least you've done a part of the CEO's job. You've taken finance to the next level. You, you've engaged in cross-functional collaboration. Uh, so these are a couple of things that, in my view, we can do is to take finance to the next level. Whatever you want to call it, secrets of high-performing high CFOs, taking finance to the next level, accelerators of growth. You know, these are things different that we can do probably differently than some of us are doing today. Some of us are probably already doing some of these things. So I wanted to share this with you. I want to, uh, before I go to q and I want to spend a couple of minutes on uh, telling you about my book that I just released about three months back called The CFO Lens. And um, what I did was I engaged uh, CFOs from eight different industries, um, you know, from telecom, from uh, media, automobiles, retail, manufacturing, I uh, interviewed them and then wrote the book because I didn't want, and then I collected lots of stories from them of actual anecdotal situations because one of the things, so when I was writing, when I said, let me write a book for finance people, I said, there is so much material available on the on, online from the big four, from McKinsey's, from senior CFO, what, what difference is, is the book going to make? Am I going to say the same thing? Going you be an enabler of growth, be an accelerator of growth, be this, be that. Everybody knows that. And somebody's going to say, hey, they may have done, I've read all this stuff a hundred times. Come on. And so I thought the only way to make it interesting to people, only made for people to relate to it, will be to make it anecdotal. And I gave you some anecdotes from my own, from me and from other, other finance professionals, CFOs and successful finance professionals. Uh, so I've written about 60 anecdotes, examples, best practices that people can take away and relate to. And I've also written it based, based on you know, different industry sets. And I tried, you know, there's a lot of material available that says uh, how finance, uh, what finance should do in, the, in transformation, what finance should do differently from what it is doing today, what finance should do to, the CFO should do to take finance to the next level. And, uh, but nobody, but very few of them talk about how. And the how is, how do you enable participate in customer experience? How do you work with customers? Uh, how do you enable business processes to become successful? Uh, how do you talk business language? How do you go beyond traditional finance roles? How do CFOs leverage analytics? I've given a very interesting, what to me was a very interesting example of a pharmaceutical company where the CFO of a pharmaceutical company, pharmacy, pharma company spent a lot of money on marketing and he did zero-based budgeting. We all want to do zero-based budgeting as CFOs. But he said, I'm going to tear the next year's budget apart on marketing. I think uh, in Indian rupee terms, he had $180 million, which is about 23 um, million US dollars of marketing spend. And he said, I'm not going to do last year plus 10%, minus 3%. You get more, I get less. I'm going to tear it apart. I'm going to start from zero. And, you know, so those kinds of real life examples and the, the results that he would achieve as a CFO were amazing um, and uh, something that the business units accepted and walked away. 
and it really added to growth and um, you know so those kinds of things um inside of you not a theoretical i'm not focused on theory and do this and i try to provide an inside of you and uh, <clears throat> what i died try to do in the book on the left hand side uh, on the last slide you can you can see some of the things that i've spoken about i kept the book to just about 200 pages because i know people don't have attention and they don't like to read bulky 300 page 400 page books i tried to deliver the message crisply provide practical guidance showcase how cfos took decisions managed problems and actually improved business performance i've spoken on topics that i just spoke about which are not very often debated in articles and uh, so many things that are available online um for example making decisions without sufficient data this is a situation that finance people are in every day to day we have to make quick decisions the market won't wait the sales teams won't wait we don't have enough data there was a era 5 years back when we could wait for data we said go bring me this data and then we can make a decision we'll wait a month two months there's no time available so how do you make decisions without sufficient data i you will be surprised i got extraordinary insights by speaking to a doctor to a surgeon uh, i asked the surgeon how do you make decisions without sufficient data about patients you don't have enough data about patients uh or you don't have the entire amount of data that you have that you think you would like to have before making a decision about a patient uh so you know those kinds of things you know and the other thing that i want finance people to focus on is quality of growth we all focus on growth but finance alone can step back and create value by measuring quality of growth and i've spoken about that at length in the book through a separate chapter on it through a separate chapter on the balance sheet and i've also dedicated an it i've spoken about topics like uh toxic leader culture that we face today you know finance people are in the middle of that they you know people want to do funny things unethical things due to steep growth targets they are not bad people but they are under so much pressure uh that uh, it makes them do or bring difficult deals to you bring difficult business partners to you so you know how do you manage those risks for organizations so that's what my book talks about i uh, this uh, i promised uh, feng that i will not uh, you know do a sales pitch on this book for more than 5 minutes and i'll keep it more to how what what different things finance can do so let me stop here i i'm a bit over time um, but uh, arun back to you uh, yeah and uh, Uh, friends, uh, you, uh, that is uh, a very good rendering from uh, uh, Ravi Kumar. Uh, may I request you to post your questions in the chat box uh, so that uh, he can address them quickly. I see a comment from Abhitab Khanna uh, saying that does anyone else on this call have similar experiences like Ravi Kumar? i share the ideas that ravi shared and have successfully implemented what ravi learned mm. from learning in the customer environment yeah so my only request is um uh we will only enlarge i mean we will leave it to questions which i can answer rather than other participants answer and uh, you know amitabh no uh, no offense meant to you i i'm happy to engage with you more on this topic or others can engage with you offline but it's not a question that i can answer so we will leave the q and a to questions that i will I will answer. Any questions? Nothing yet. Uh, I suppose. Uh... uh i think uh, people are quite satisfied uh, though i just see a new message just a minute yeah we know sha yeah um yeah. uh in the first slide the technology play a major role in the finance function uh in the first slide uh, what's your question you know can you verbally say it? uh so in the first slide okay can go through the first slide yeah yeah i i understand the point Yeah. There's four bullet points. Okay, in the, the one of the bullet point, uh, now everybody focus on the technology, which is. Uh, is it the one that you're talking about, or the next one? The first one, first one. Yes, yes. 
okay. the four bullet points. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is the technology is it plays a major role here? No, I uh, so first of all, this uh, presentation as I made at the as I said at the beginning of the start is not intended to be comprehensive. I'm not comprehensively trying to cover everything that is important. There are many things that are important. Technology uh, should be on the first uh, bullet of you know um, any uh, business objective or business initiative. But it's just not. I've just not spoken about it. Uh, you know, we can is technology important. Techn in every one of those things that I point that I can that I've spoken about right from building, including building soft skills, uh, technology has a role to play. Right. Um, uh, and we can talk about that offline. You know. I'm happy to talk about it, but I did not include technology. I did not include many things. This is not a comprehensive deck of all that is important for finance to do. These are some of the things that finance to do, in my opinion, that I wanted to share about. Yeah. I think... Uh... There's no further questions. Okay. I'm yeah. happy to, uh, you know, engage with all the participants. Uh, uh, you know, my, my uh, you can search for me on LinkedIn by the name Ravi Kumar Ramanan, R-A-M-A-N-A-N. -A 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 -A. uh, can share your mail ID also in the chat box. Uh, probably that will help in case they want to reach out to yeah, you. Yeah, sure. So my, my mail ID is, uh, so you, I can reply to that. Uh, my mail ID is yeah. you can write to me. You can write to me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can write to me on mail. I prefer you to write to me on LinkedIn, but anyway, that's any fine thing. Andrew, thank you so much. So I Thank you, Shivraj. So, Ravi, uh, I think it was a very comprehensive presentation, though you uh, identified a few of the elements uh, that are required for the CFOs uh, to consider, uh, and especially uh, the need, the stress on the uh, stress is on getting out of your ivory tower. Uh, Arun, I'll just make Arun, I'll just make one statement. I'm sorry to interrupt you. So my book, uh, I forgot to mention, is available on Amazon worldwide. Okay. Uh, it can be purchased in any country. Okay. Uh, um, and uh, search for the CFO lens. Okay. And um, uh, in India, it's available in Flipkart apart from Amazon. And on the the uh, ebook version is available on Kindle and other platforms. So you can you know buy it anywhere there. Yeah, we had shared that link also in the in our FENG website. Uh, so those who are interested can use that link to uh, click and then uh, do the purchase. So, one, so there's one. The last comment is uh, can can be. Buy your book, The Oriental Tunes. This is so. This is my book, The CFO Lens. Um, and I, the, the, you know, I showed it to you. This is my other book, The Oriental yeah. Tunes. The they are book. interested in that. The question was about I know that. a lot of people are interested in Japan and China as much as in finance, but <laughs> I have not published. I have not published this book so far. I am not published <laughs> in like six months, and I will definitely communicate that to people. I only privately distributed it earlier. Uh, now I'm going to publish it. I'm, I've already started uh, the publishing process. Uh, so that's good. Uh, yeah, be kind to me. Buy my published book first, and I'll also share my unpublished book later. <laughs> sure, I so, look forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. So as I was mentioning, so I think uh, there are good insights uh, on uh, getting out, uh, getting out of your ivory tower. And, uh, you know, uh, having more skin in the game, especially on the customer facing ones, which uh, you had uh, quoted rightly that uh, that is the key to success of the entire company, not only the finance function, uh, whether in a startup scenario or in a mature business scenario. So instead of uh, on also on the professional uh, leadership quality of uh, not holding uh, a grudge uh, when uh, something is uh, 
approved beyond your powers. So, and then you need to wholeheartedly participate in it. I think these are all vital key uh, elements of the performance of a good CFO uh, in uh, rendering his uh, responsibilities. So, I guess uh, we had a uh, we had a lot of good many things from you today uh, uh, to all the registrants uh, and the members of the Feng at uh, India. Uh, and others who has joined from across the world. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for uh, accepting uh, my request to you know share your insights. Uh, I believe it is very valuable uh, for all of us. Uh, I look forward to have uh, more interactions with you in your future publishing endeavors too. Uh, so with that- uh, Thank you, thanks, uh, thanks to APNG for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank uh, you. To speak to a global audience. Uh, thanks everybody for joining in.